Okay, the next item of business is a debate on motion 13480 in the name of Graham Simpson on improving uh, uh, Scotland's roads. I invite members wishing to participate to press the re uh, request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. I advise the chamber we have no time in hand uh, this afternoon. And I call on Graham Simpson to speak to and move the motion around seven minutes. Uh, Mr Simpson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I move the motion in my name. Now, Presiding Officer, I don't know about you, but I think uh, that one of the basic infrastructure requirements of any country is to make it easy to get around. Yeah. It's kind of vital to people, and it's certainly vital to the economy. For the country to function, we need to get a few basics right, and chief among those requirements is decent roads. Not necessarily more roads, just better ones. World leaders not queuing up to get advice on that from the Scottish Government, and nor are leaders from anywhere else in Britain, because Scotland is ahead of the game, but only in the amount of potholes we have. Earlier this year, researchers who analysed reports of potholes in 69 cities across Britain, registered via fixmystreet.com, found that Glasgow was the worst, followed by Edinburgh. Now, I see China has landed a craft on the crater-filled dark side of the moon. They could have saved themselves the bother and just come to Glasgow. Or Caithness, where it's been reported that people are leaving because of the state of the roads. Scotland's roads are so bad, you could almost think it's deliberate. It's as if we're living in some dystopian experiment led by a faceless green committee who sit around trying to think of ways to stop us driving. Now, I don't blame the councils. Not even anti-car Edinburgh would actually want their roads to be as bad as they are. No, this comes down to the decline in funding that our councils have had under the SNP, and it's time we stopped that. I'll take the intervention. Sarah Boyack briefly. A, a member quite rightly mentioned Edinburgh and our problem of potholes, but, but he is, a, is he aware that in the recent budget decisions, uh, the proposal by the SNP to cut the budget by around five million was defeated by the rest of the council. So at least, it, you know, it's not going to get even worse in that sense. Graham Simpson. Well, common sense uh, from Edinburgh for a change. Now. Um, when it comes to moving goods and people, then it's our trunk road network that does the heavy lifting, and it is found wanting. From the A75 and A77 to the A1 to the A9, full dueling by 2025, promised in 2011, and the A96, dueling promised in 2007, and I could even throw in the M8, not to mention the rest and be thankful, we have main roads in serious need of upgrading and all years behind where they should be under the SNP. I'll take in Liam Kerr. Liam Kerr, briefly. Yeah, I'm very grateful. As the member said, the SNP has broken a 17-year-old promise to duel the A96 from Inverness to Aberdeen. Now, a delaying tactic report is now a year and a half late, has cost £5 million so far, and John Swinney made comments in Elgin at the weekend that suggest it will be further delayed. Does the member think that the SNP have shamefully taken the people of the North East for fools, need to stop the excuses and get on with duelling the A96? Graham Simpson. Yes. <laughs> now, there are tragic consequences for failing to invest. There were 144 deaths on Scotland's major trunk roads that go outside the central belt between 2020 and 23 and 104 of those were on sections that were not dueled. Now, failing to invest can also hit people in the pocket. A constituent of mine found that out when his car suffered hundreds of pounds of damage when he was driving along the M8 at night. But Amy, whose job it is to maintain that road, told him it's not the duty of an operating company to make all roads under their control completely safe. Our duty is to maintain roads in a condition which is safe for road users who are themselves exercising reasonable care. In other words, if you don't look out for potholes and you hit one, then it's your own fault. It's no wonder that driving instructors are now teaching their students how to avoid them in Scotland. Just don't go out. Now, the Cabinet Secretary may well say that this debate is just us trying to score points ahead of a general election. She will say that, 
Or she may not, now that I've headed her off at the pass. And she would be wrong, because we've been making these points for years, and we're no nearer seeing roads like the A9 completed. But to read the government's amendment today, you would think everything is just fine, that they're cracking on with things, and there's just a temporary pause because, wait for it, of Westminster. Now, presiding officer, I think we should finish with a game. It's called Guess Who Said This? And it's all about the A9. Now, the first one is easy. I'm sorry that we will not have dueled the A9 by 2025. I want to be clear, though, that I do not accept that we failed to meet the target because we just did not bother and we were not trying to meet it. The 2025 target was set for the right reasons and we were committed to it. No prizes for guessing that was Nicola Sturgeon last week. How about this one? The A9 is the backbone of Scotland. It must be safe, reliable and resilient as possible. And that's what the Scottish Government will deliver. The Scottish Government will deliver. And while you're all being impressed by the stand-up comedy abilities of that speaker, I can tell you it was none other than Mari McCallan. Finally, who is this? This is not an easy project. The A9 duelling is one of the most sophisticated pieces of infrastructure we've ever undertaken. Things are getting done. We need to move on from this. I get sick and tired of listening to the Tories constantly bringing this up in Parliament as if they own the issue. It's us that is the first government who has ever pledged to duel the A9 in its entirety. Now, control yourselves now. Any guesses? No? Well, the answer is witty Pete Wishart in his stirring address to the SNP conference last year. A series of SNP figures with delusional outlooks, presiding officer, they've had 17 years to deliver. They have not delivered. They will never deliver. They need to go. Thank you. I now call on Fiona Hislop to speak to and move the amendment 13480.3. Cabinet Secretary, up to five minutes, please. Uh, President Officer, I move the amendment in my name. The Scottish Government recognises fully the important role that a safe and efficient road network performs. The network is vital because it connects our cities, rural communities and the ports that serve the islands. Investment in maintaining and improving roads is fundamental to the economic, social and environmental well-being of Scotland. And I welcome today's debate because it gives the opportunity to set all the progress this Government has made on trunk roads it is responsible for, particularly in the past year. And of course, the SNP government has made significant investments to improve Scotland's road network in recent years. Projects already delivered include the Queensferry Crossing, the M8 motorway improvements and the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, which are delivering tangible benefits to lives across the country on a daily basis. Projects that Labour and Conservatives speculated about for decade upon decade, but never delivered. But it has been the SNP and government who have delivered. Very, very briefly. Kevin Stewart, briefly. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, does the Transport Secretary agree with me that it's somewhat disgraceful that it took from 1948, when it first went on paper at the planning stage, till there was an SNP government to deliver the WPR ignored by Tory and Labour? Cabinet Secretary, can we please listen to the person who has the floor? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I thank the member for reminding us of that very important point. Now, more recent projects include A9 duelling, Lunkerty to Pass of Burnham and the A77 Mabel Bypass. We also continue to invest in further upgrades to our roads. In December last year, we set out the delivery plan for completing the A9 duelling, reaffirming our steadfast commitment to improving safety on this important economic art art artery and key route connecting our Highlands communities. The delivery plan sets out a realistic and achievable time table for completion, balancing market capacity. No, I won't. This is a very brief debate at the choice of the Tories. The impacts on road users and the availability of funding. The approach means that the Highlands can have confidence that the duelling will be delivered in full by this government. In May, we published the contract notice for the fourth section, the Tay Crossing to Ballinuig, and we expect to award the contract for that project in summer 2025. We will also shortly complete the procurement process for the Tomatin Tomoy project, and 
and I am pleased to inform members that three tender submissions were received on 31 May, and we expect to award the contract for this project in July. Similarly, no, this is a very short debate at the choice of the Conservatives. Similarly, uh, President Officer, I reaffirm this Government's commitment to improving the A96, including the duelling of the Inverness to Nairn and the Nairn Bypass. I announced last week that the statutory authorisation process with the maid orders has now completed, and thus this now clears the way for ministers to acquire the land required to construct the Inverness to Nairn, including Nairn Bypass, and Transport Scotland is pressing ahead with the procedural steps to make this happen. I am sorry, uh, President Officer, but I have only got two minutes left, for, and I apologise to Fergus Ewing. Work has also commenced to determine the most suitable procurement option for delivering the scheme and thereafter a timetable for progress can then be set in line with available budgets. This Government is also committed to delivering an infrastructure solution to address the landslip risks at the A83 rest to be thankful, and along with making improvements to the A75 with the procurement of technical advisers underway to take forward design work on the Springham and Crockettford bypasses benefiting locals, hauliers and tourists and especially the residents of these two villages. And to help reach our aim of achieving the best world safety performance in the world by 2030, this Government's investment in safely operating and maintaining the trunk road network, I'm sure Mr Simpson will be interested in this, will increase by over 30% this year, from over £525 million in 2023-24 to over £683 million in 2024-25, despite reduced capital funding from the UK Government. And while the Conservatives might want to turn a UK election into one about the most local of issues, potholes, we need to remember that it is local authorities which have responsibility to manage and maintain roads within their area. President Officer, what can we, do, we can do, however, is to send a clear message to the next UK Government. We are taking forward all of the work I've just described and that progress on maintaining and improving roads despite the problems caused by the last UK Government's spring budget, which, taking into account inflation, is forecast to result in an almost 9% real terms cut in our capital funding. That is why... In this amendment, we are calling for the incoming UK Government to deliver an emergency budget to address the £1.3 billion plus hole in Scotland's capital budget created by the UK Government. Surely, President Officer, that is something that everyone in this Parliament can get behind and support the call from the SNP Government in this amendment to put the interests of Scotland first. Thank you. I now call on Alec Rowley to speak to and move Amendment 13480.2. Up to four minutes, Mr Rowley. Thank you, President Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. In January, the AA released their latest pothole index, showing that across the UK, car damage caused by potholes was the worst it had ever been in five years, with an estimated £475 million worth of damage in 2023. The timing of this debate today is quite fitting, given that most members in here will be spending time out there in communities. And certainly, the communities that I have been in speaking to people, the issue of potholes comes up time and time again. I agree with the motion where it raises the issue of chronic underfunding of local authorities that this government has provided over. And the Cabinet Secretary demonstrated that herself there, where she talked about the investment in trunk roads and then said that for all other roads, it's the responsibility of local authorities. But the fact is, this SNP government have completely hammered local authority funding yeah. disproportionately to all other cuts in funding across uh, Scotland. Local government have taken the hardest hit, and it is my view that a massive amount of the potholes and problems that people in car day in and day out are on local authority roads. So it's not good enough for the Cabinet Secretary to simply say that's down to the local authorities when you've slashed the local authority budgets and they have had to prioritise between education, between social work and between putting money into things like roads. And the roads have suffered as a result of that, and the people that are driving the cars have suffered as a result of that. It's not just for people driving cars and the damage and the maintenance and the cost that, that families, that individuals in car as a result of those cuts 
from this SNP government. It's also pedestrians. Have you ever tried, if, you're, if, you, if, you've, if, you, if you've got sight problems, trying to cross a road and, and, and hitting a pothole? Pavements as well. So these budgets have been slashed and it's not good enough. In the time that I have, I also want to talk about the Bus Partnership Fund, which I have put into to my amendment. The fund was described as a landmark long-term capital investment of over £500 million for bus priority measures but only £26.9 million was spent before the, 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 the fund was paused. Now, after that fund was paused and speaking to transport authorities across Scotland, there was actually hundreds of millions of pounds of bids worked up for the bus uh, partnership fund, and that seems to have just been frozen with these bids sitting on Transport Scotland. Now, I absolutely believe that if we are to reach our net zero targets, if we are to reach the targets that the SNP Government have laid down in terms of getting car mileage reduced by 20 per cent, then we have to invest in public transport. Public transport and the investment in it has to come first. As a bus user coming down the M90 motorway and passing all the cars in the morning, I often think to myself, why on earth did I ever drive and sit in those big queues? As you come up onto the fourth bridge and you see the queues for the Queen's Ferry crossing, I think that is the right way that we need to go. But then as you come into Edinburgh, your bus starts to get caught in traffic. And that's where the whole scheme falls down. So these investments are absolutely crucial. If we are going to see at the end of the day the targets actually achieved. So don't just blame Council's Cabinet Secretary. Get the investment in and get the potholes fixed, whether it's Council or Government that is responsible for the road. Thank you, Mr Rowley. I now call Ariane Burgess. Up to four minutes, Ms Burgess. Presiding officer, as a nation, we face an urgent climate crisis that demands bold action. The transport sector in Scotland is Scotland's most significant contributor to climate change, responsible for over a quarter of our greenhouse gas emissions. Despite this, we have made little progress in reducing those emissions over the past 30 years. Our current approach to transportation is not sustainable and requires a fundamental shift. As an MSP for the Highlands and Islands, it is absolutely clear to me that a well-maintained road network is vital for our economy and our communities. In some parts of my region, these roads, like the rest and be thankful, are lifeline roads that provide the only practical way in and out of Argyll. But our infrastructure investment needs to be bolder and more ambitious than road upgrades and expansions. Too often, our transport plans seem to start and end with road upgrades and expansions rather than looking at all the transport options that we need to invest in, from buses to bikes, rail and ferries. The Scottish Government has committed to reducing car, kilometer, car kilometres by 20% by 2030, a target that aligns with our legally binding climate commitments. However, the proposed road upgrades and expansions, such as the full dueling of the A9 and the A96, directly contradict this. Building more and bigger roads will only encourage increased car usage, generate more greenhouse gas emissions and undermine our efforts to combat climate change. Over the past decade, the Scottish Government has spent £4 billion on road building projects with ongoing or planned projects estimated to cost at least £7 billion. Shockingly, the average completion cost of these projects has escalated by 86%. This is a poor use of taxpayer money and a misguided approach to addressing our transportation needs. Invest, instead of investing billions in high carbon new road infrastructure, we should redirect these funds towards sustainable alternatives that benefit all of Scotland's residents. This includes expanding our public transport and active travel networks, which will reduce emissions, improve public health and reduce inequalities. It's worth noting that around 28% of Scottish households do not have car access and would not benefit from the proposed road expansions. Furthermore, the argument for... I'm not going to take interventions because of being short on time. Furthermore, the argument for road upgrades based on safety concerns is more complex than it may seem. On the A9, for example, accident rates and injury collisions are higher per mile on jewelled sections 
than non-dual sections, more effective and less costly measures to improve road safety Mr. Ewing. include average speed cameras, improved signage, education and policing to reduce speeding and dangerous overtaking. A far better use of funds would be dueling the Highland Main Line, a key Highland infrastructure route that has not seen an expansion in its capacity since the 19th century. Investing in railways means expanding safe, low-carbon travel, take, taking freight and commuters off roads and significantly reducing transport emissions. Investing in railways means expanding safe, low-carbon travel. Rather than the eye-watering overspends associated with road projects, recent rail projects have been substantially cheaper per mile and their popularity once operating has significantly exceeded estimates. Three times as many passengers use the Borders Railway than was estimated when making the business case. Just last week, we welcomed the reopening of the Leavenmouth line at a cost of just over £19 million per mile. At current, at current estimates, dueling the A9 will cost more than £46 million per mile. Is this the best use of stretched government Need funds in the midst of a climate crisis? In conclusion, while I support the fair funding of Scottish local authorities to maintain our existing road networks, I cannot support the prioritisation Thank you, Ms. Burgess. Thank you. Expansions. I now need to call Beatrice Wishart up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A report in 2022 highlighted that the cost of fixing potholes across all of Scotland's roads was £1.7 billion, and the number has only risen since then. The Scots backlog figure shows the cost of treating all road sections categorised as red or amber within one year. The 2023 backlog figure was nearly £2.2 billion. News reports from Caithness highlight the impacts on residents from driving longer routes to avoid damaged roads to facing prohibitively expensive car repairs. Local authorities are facing challenging financial conditions, and without adequate funding for road maintenance and upgrades, councils have to prioritise which roads receive attention, meaning other upgrades get postponed, with the risk that the road condition degrades further in the meantime and ultimately costing more to repair. A prominent example from my own constituency is the Colligo Road. It's the Council's highest priority major road development, but has been subject to delays, and the estimated cost of the new road has risen over time to £9.9 .9 million. It's an important link for aquaculture and fishing traffic, which needs to travel to and from the pier at Colligo, as well as for the other developments by the proactive North Yale Development Council, like the Business Park and proposed Caravan Park. Despite this, it's still a single-track road in poor condition. Without an upgrade to a two-lane road, it remains a challenge for local industry to navigate. The planning application has now been submitted, so I am hopeful we will see progress soon. Another road project in Shetland is the widening of the Leavenwick Road, and it too has faced many delays. In December, the Council said it could be a number of years before work can begin. The road is currently narrower than the current design standards of 6.8 metres, and it's also the main road to the airport. Presiding officer, road improvements are crucially linked to road safety. Recent Transport Scotland figures show that in 2023, 155 people lost their lives on Scotland's roads. Scotland is not on track to meet the road casualty reduction target of 50%, 50 reduction by 2030. 155 lives lost on Scotland's roads is 155 lives too many, and I offer my condolences to everyone affected. When the SNP came into government in 2007, they pledged action to improve trunk roads in the north and northeast. Communities across Scotland deserve better than missed targets and deadlines. As a matter of public safety, our roads urgently need to be upgraded. Last week, Nicola Sturgeon said she's sorry the Scottish Government's commitment to duel the A9 from Inverness to Perth by 2025 could not be met. Yet she said that the project had faced challenges beyond the Scottish Government's control, avoiding full responsibility for the delays. The admission that the Scottish Government commitment to duelling the A9 by 2025 is, uh, is unachievable is both a betrayal of trust and neglect towards people living in the north of Scotland. Ten out of the eleven most dangerous single car carriageway sections of the A9 are north of Inverness. The Scottish Liberal Democrats are committed to delivering core connections for the Highlands and Islands, including investment in programmes such as the A9 and A96. 
Upgrading these roads will reduce the severity and rate of accidents, better connect the highlands and islands, and improve access to employment opportunities and services, including making it quicker and safer to access hospitals. It would also improve public transport journey times. The Scottish Government must publish a detailed roadmap for the completion of the duelling programmes for the A9 and A96 and commit to investing in infrastructure across the Highlands and Islands. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. We now move to the open debate. I call first uh, Edward Mountain to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Up to four minutes, Mr. Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I thank Graham Simpson for bringing this uh, debate forward. And I'm disappointed by reading the SNP amendment to it because it says they're perfect and they've got everything under control. Well, that was clear at the uh, petitions committee, which I've had the privilege to attend to hear evidence on the A9 that that isn't the case. In fact, it was clear that Alex Salmon was committed to duelling uh, the roads between our key cities, but that seems to have dropped by the wayside by a member who took on, a member of his cabinet who didn't even actually recognise that she was in the same cabinet as Alex Salmon at some stage uh, when she became First Minister, because it became clear in 2017 that the First Minister then, Nicola Sturgeon, knew that the A9 duelling could not be delivered by 2025. Yeah. Yeah. So the honest thing to do would have come forward and tell the people of the Highlands that. Mm -hmm. But that's not what happened. We had disingenuous, dishonest statements put forward saying that it was continuing to push forward. And that was never going to happen. It wasn't possible. Now, I don't want to steal all Meadows Fraser's thunder on the A9, because I know he'll want to speak long and hard about it, but I would say that the people of the Highlands, I think, had, and it's a great description, were hornswoggled by this government. And that word's a good word, because it covers up a lot of the words that I couldn't possibly use in this chamber. But turning to the A96, presiding officer, that road was supposed to be duelled in uh, 2011. It was said it was going to happen in the infrastructure plan. And we know that in 2016 there were update, updated plans put forward for that. And I remember those going out to consultation when I was first elected. We were all excited that finally the A96 was going to be duelled. And then we had the 2017, all the ground surveys had been completed. Nothing in the way. We knew, in fact, those ground surveys had cost over a million pounds a mile to do them just from Inverness to Nairn. A huge amount of money. So there it was, it was all going to happen, and in 2018, when the local inquiry met and we got the results of that, we thought we were there, home and dry. But we're not home and dry. It's not going to be duelled. In fact, only a short section of it is going to be duelled, the Nairn Bypass. And what disappoints me is the Cabinet Secretary, when she turned up at the Net Zero Committee and uh, Energy and Transport Committee yesterday, when pushed whether she'd meet the uh, deadline of 2030, she was unable to say that. I think she was even unable to say that when she went to Nairn on Saturday, where I hear the reception was less than favourable. But she tells us that made orders are made, but nothing's actually happened. I see Mr Ewing rising to his feet. Always a pleasure to welcome Mr Ewing to speak favourably in one of our debates. Fergus Ewing briefly. Does Mr Mountain agree with me that it's absolutely essential that the Scottish Government make a statement that the section of the A9 between Smithton and Alder, including their bypass, will be duelled, setting out when it will start and when it will be finished, and that statement must be made before the end of the year. A red line for me, ink written by my constituents. Edward Mayne. And Mr Ewing and I share constituents, and I would totally agree with him, and it's a fairly reasonable ask, uh, and I can't believe that the government aren't going to commit to that. As for the rest of the A96, we seem to be waiting on the results of a review, a review, presiding, uh, presiding officer, which we were told was going to be a transparent and evidence-based review demanded by the Greens to see whether this road is what the people in the Highlands wanted. Well, I can tell you, you don't need a review to know that. We need it, and we need it now. Yeah. Now, presiding officer, I could go on, but the time's stretching. Maybe just to say that when it comes to roads in Caithness, the Caithness Roads Recovery Crew have made it quite clear that you'd be better off in a tractor than a car and that shake, rattle and roll isn't a dance anymore. It's what you do getting into the high street. Presiding officer, I'll leave it there because we've got lots of more speakers to hear from. Thank you. I now call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Paul Sweeney. Up to four minutes, Mr <coughs> McMillan. Uh, thank you very much, Sir Singh. Also, I first want to thank Graham Simpson for bringing this debate to the Parliament today as it gives me the opportunity publicly to thank the Scottish Government, Transport Scotland and also Amy for the investment that is taking place in the Trunk Road Network in my constituency. 
I have long campaigned for improved trunk roads in Inverclyde, and when I was a West of Scotland regional MSP, I had a, a regular dialogue with Transport Scotland about the condition of the roads. And at the beginning of the meeting, the first meeting I had with the then Chief Executive of Transport Scotland, his opening remarks to me were that he received more correspondence from me about a small part of the national network than any other MSP, including ones with far greater trunk road footprints in their area. He acknowledged there was an issue and he wanted to fix that problem. There have been some false dawns in the past, with improvements being sporadic, but uh, kept the pressure on Transport Scotland, Transfer Scotland previously, and now also AMI. Now, the level of investment in the A8 and the A78 uh, in Inverclyde the A over, uh, was over £3.2 million between 2022 and 2023, uh, in planned schemes inside uh, the area, and more, regular, uh, more money spent on regular maintenance like carriageway patching. But currently, a great deal of resurfacing is taking place on the A8 corridor between Port Glasgow and Greenock. We have already had a great deal of resurfacing on the A78 in the other part of the constituency. Now, the A8 has needed this for a couple of years, but the project was delayed, not due to neglect, but because Scottish Water were installing a flood prevention scheme worth over £2.5 million, and that work lasted for approximately one year. Now, the scheme is something I campaigned for since 2009, and I am delighted that it has now been installed. Now, some would argue that uh, I should be disappointed it took so long to be delivered, and I was, but the fact that the record-keeping of underground infrastructure was not up to date by any of the relevant agencies, and that, that meant an integrated catchment study for Inverclyde had to be produced between Scottish Water, Inverclyde Council and also Transport Scotland before any plans could be progressed. Now, Inverclyde has got two trunk roads, the A8 and the A78 which are crucial to the community and also to the local economy. Now, these roads being in good condition is essential because of the thousands of vehicles that use the roads daily. Uh, it is also because of the issue of road safety. Now, whether it is internal or, or external commuters, bus traffic, emergency services, lorries and the business community, these two roads are absolutely pivotal for Inverclyde. And if one of them closes, it creates a huge problem for the area. I only have four minutes, Mr Simpson, I'm sorry. And that is why I am delighted to see the improvements taking place and I know that drivers will be able to travel on the roads, which are going to be better and also, crucially, safer. Now, in the past, I have taken uh, Transport Scotland uh, and also Transself Scotland staff for the drive around the local network to highlight the problems that existed at the time. And this is due to happen again on Friday this week with Amy, but sadly, I am now going to be attending a funeral, so that is going to be rearranged. But I do know, however, that the list of outstanding issues for them will be a great deal less than previously. I'm saying also the easiest thing for any politician to do is to criticise something when there is a problem. And sometimes that's quite right, and that's the right thing to do. But what I've always attempted to try and do is to offer potential solutions to improve the situation, whatever that may be. And furthermore, when those improvements do take place, it's only correct to actually thank those who have made the difference. So with that, I do want to thank Scottish Water for their investment in the flood prevention work. I want to thank Transport Scotland for sticking by their commitment to work to improve the local network in the Greenock and Inverclyde constituency. I want to thank Amy for being responsive and doing a great job locally. Now, they know there is more to do, including improving the, the timings of the traffic light system, which is raised consistently by the Inverclyde Chamber of Commerce. And finally, I do want to thank the Scottish Government for ensuring the finance has been there to improve the A8 and the A78, despite the cuts coming from the UK Government. Now, I know that my constituents certainly appreciate this investment that has went in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Macmillan. I now call Paul Sweeney to be followed by Finlay Carson. Up to four minutes, Mr Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. When I was first elected to Parliament in 2017, I met uh, Vince Cable, and I didn't think I would have very much in common with a Liberal Democrat MP for a London constituency, but he did inform me that, in fact, he started his political career in Glasgow when he was elected as a councillor for the Glasgow Corporation in 1971, as a Labour councillor, in fact. Uh, and he then told me that his greatest achievement in politics to date, despite serving in the Cabinet, despite rising to the, some of the highest offices in the land, was actually successfully persuading uh, the Corporation of the City to cancel the Maryhill Motorway project in one of the last acts of Glasgow Corporation before it was merged into Strathclyde Regional Council. And I then reflected on being elected to this place uh, in 2021, coinciding with a huge project just adjacent to where the Maryhill Motorway was to be built at the Woodside Viaducts. That was completed in the same year Vince Cable was elected, 1971, but is now going to have to be expensively rebuilt because the whole structure, which is about 300 metres long, is suffering from what is colloquially known as concrete cancer. 
uh, is effectively crumbling uh, and is destabilised. That is now going to cost up to £152 million, £71 million more than first anticipated, simply to prop the structure temporarily. And that will now last until 2026, the end of this Parliament. As an elected parliamentarian from Glasgow, I have had no consultation and no one has asked the opinion of my constituents about whether this is appropriate expenditure. And we have heard about the pressures across the Trunk Road network elsewhere in Scotland. Happy to give way. Cabinet Secretary. I, I would extend an invitation to Paul Sweeney to visit and see the problems of that structure, as he says, was per, first built back in the 1970s. It's a serious issue, and I uh, hope that he will be properly informed once he has that briefing and that personal inspection, along with other MSPs from the Glasgow area. Paul Sweeney. Well, I thank the Minister for that kind invitation. I look forward to arranging that. And I'm in no doubt about the seriousness of the issues with that particular piece of infrastructure, over half a century old as it is. However, I think that there's been a bit of narrow-mindedness when it comes to Transport Scotland's consideration of all the options available. After all, this is just a temporary propping measure. It's not even the permanent repair. Look around the world. The campaign for the highways to boulevards across the world is showing real cutting-edge innovation in urban planning and how to deal with the legacy of urban motorways that was in vogue half a century ago. There are many new ideas out there that we should be exploring. At-grade boulevards are increasingly seen as the best practice across the world. And I would point to numerous examples from San Francisco, Boston, Seoul, Montreal, and indeed in Paris, where the Georges Pompidou Expressway was replaced by an urban boulevard in 2016 under Anne Hidalgo, who was, has served as the mayor of Paris since 2014, a pioneer of the 15-minute city movement. That has moved 73,000 vehicles uh, a day off of the Paris waterfront at the Seine. And indeed, we've got these plans in place. Glasgow City Council has been working with Dutch architect Wayne Mass and Austin Smith Law to prepare district regeneration frameworks, which point a way to reducing the severe impact that the M8 has. At the time it was opened in 1971, protesters gathered above the overpass at Charing Cross with a banner saying, this scar will never heal. The programme that has been prepared by Glasgow City Council actually has a set of categories saying how to heal Glasgow's motorway scar. We're not talking about closing the M8. We're not talking about closing it down altogether. We're talking about a reimagination of this road in the context of an inner city environment, looking at best practice around the world, from Paris to Seattle. Uh, we should be trying to be world leaders in this, and the government wants to be world leaders and wants to achieve its objectives of reducing car use while maintaining those critical road networks. We should be looking at unlocking that value. Glasgow city centre has the equivalent of Inverness city centre's worth of motorway running through it. It needs to be reimagined, and we could release huge amounts of currently sterilised inner-city land that could then be repurposed and developed that could return a significant positive contribution to the public purse to invest elsewhere in Scotland. I would urge the Minister to explore all these opportunities for the betterment of Glasgow and Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Sweeney. I now call Finlay Carson to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Up to four minutes, Mr Carson. Presiding officer, Dick Whittington set out to discover if the streets of London were paved with gold. If he was making a similar journey today, the chances are he would find his way to the A75 before heading up the A77. Because make no mistake, these are golden highways, but unfortunately are not treated as such when it comes to investment from this SNP government. The two routes carry goods worth close to £9 billion annually, as 400,000 freight vehicles travel along the 95-mile stretch of the A75 between Gretna and the ports of Cairn Ryan, and onwards to Northern Ireland and beyond. A strategic economic impact assessment produced by Dumfries and Galloway Council, together with South Ayrshire Council and Mid and East Antrim Borough Council, can evidence enormous financial benefits that could be gained by improving both trunk roads. The findings also pointed to environmental gains by greatly reducing carbon dioxide emissions, uh, which would assist us in reaching the climate change targets. The report examined seven upgrade packages ranging from fully dueling the A75 and 77, as well as simply in investigating uh, initiating bypasses around uh, key towns and junction improvements. If both were fully uh, dueled, close to £5 billion worth of positive benefits would be generated, with, either, with even the lowest upgrade package accruing in excess of £1 billion. The financial rewards would come through improved journey times and lower vehicle operating costs. 
So it's no surprise that the port operators at Cairn Ryan, Stena, Pino and Belvis Harbours have been lobbying hard for improvements on both roads. As Andy Kane, the regional ports operation manager for Stena Line, said, the full potential I'm sorry I don't have time um, the full potential of the South West Scotland cannot be unlocked until these roads are upgraded. As this was all, and this was all before the announcement of the Belfast Investment Zone, which would cover Stranraer and Cairnrine, or indeed Stena's green energy plans. The A75 and 77 are the two of the slowest roads in Scotland and remain two of the most dangerous, with casualties reported every three days, and too many resulting in fatalities. I have written to three different transport secretaries, including Fiona Hislop, urging her to introduce average speed cameras in conjunction with an increase in the current speed limit from 40 to 50 miles per hour for HGV vehicles, a move that has brought benefits in other parts of the country. Now, we know that A75 was identified in the Union Connectivity Review as one of the UK's key transport and infrastructure projects. Bizarrely, the then Transport Minister, Michael Matheson, instructed officials at Transport Scotland not to engage in it. Not his only example of poor judgment, but I would say one of the worst. Although, in fairness, he's not alone. His former ministers, Alex Salmon, Nicholas Sturgeon and Hamza Youssef, previously promised improvements only to fail to deliver. I hope Fiona Hislop will be different. Because on a positive note, the UK Government has stepped up uh, with funding and both Scotland's governments have been working on a feasibility study ahead of a multi-million pound upgrade at Crockett Ford and Spring Home. And hopefully progress has been made and a timetable will be forthcoming in the near future and perhaps the Cabinet Secretary can update us on this. Presiding Officer, I have lived within touching distance of the A75 of all my life. And the A75 touches people's lives in Dumfries and Galloway in, no way, in, in, in a way that no other road in Scotland comes close. It's a vital artery to work and to life, and sadly for many has been the scene of too many tragedies. The road must change, and it must change for the better. Pre-devolution, the Scottish Conservative MPs Ian Lang and Sir Hector Munro delivered numerous bypasses and many miles of road improvements. Sadly, the SNP in the last seven years have delivered nothing but empty words and broken promises. Thank you. We now move to the final speaker in the open debate, Fulton McGregor, up to four minutes. Mr McGregor. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. Um, and members may uh, wish to excuse my voice today. I'm suffering with a wee bit of a cold. Uh, today's motion concerns road networks across Scotland and calls for fair funding to local authorities to ensure that roads remain well maintained and safe. And I do agree with this motion's sentiment that a well maintained road network is paramount to Scotland's economy. I would add that as well as the economy, a well maintained network is vital in achieving road safety for all those travelling and commuting across the country. As we have heard, the Scottish Government's commitment to road safety was underlined by the announcement of £36 million in funding for road safety in this year's budget, up £5 million from last year's. And in the budget for 2022-23 financial year, road safety funding amounted to £31 million. Pounds. Nearly £10 million pounds was granted to local authorities through the Road Safety Improvement Fund. That fund works to support the delivery of targeted safe system initiatives. And nearly £4 million pounds was given to Road Safety Scotland to carry out education and publicity projects. And £12 million went to road safety measures in Scotland's trunk road network. The remaining funds, amounting to just under £8 million, went to evidence-led enforcement through Scottish the Scottish Safety Camera Programme. I, I, I would point out that at that point, President Officer, there are two uh, cameras in my constituency that have been uh, taken out of service, and, and I'm not sure uh, if that will make matters better. And I have written to the Scottish Safety Camera Programme about both of those cameras. It is through these substantial investments, however, that the Government want to see their long-term vision where no one is killed or seriously injured in Scotland's roads by 2050. Now, currently, the M73 and M80 motorway's vital links, which pass through the north of my constituency of Coatbridge and Christ, are undergoing 14 weeks of maintenance and repair, including installation of new safety barriers, replacement of bridge joints, surfacing repairs, various cyclic maintenance activities, and structural concrete repairs. These works are critical to ensure the safety and efficiency of our road network here in Scotland. And, of course, the M8 improvements, um, which were fairly recent, um, which took congestion off the A8 part that runs through my constituency to the south. And, uh, these improvements have done a lot to connect Coatbridge and Chryson and, of course, other areas of Lanarkshire to the rest of Scotland. And what a massive improvement. And anybody who used to use the A before the improvements will know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm sure Graeme Simpson is one of us. Yeah, absolutely. Graeme Simpson. <coughs> what does uh, Fulton McGregor think of the condition 
of the council-owned roads in his constituency. Fulton McGregor. Uh, I'll come to the, the council uh, in a wee bit, but I thank the member for the intervention. But I would encourage, talking about the, the, the motorway, I mean, again, I'd encourage members to pay heed to the tourist information signs, such as those for McKinnon Mills, Summerlee and the time capsule, when they are considering solar activities for the family. So when you're driving by, you can have a whole day out in Coatbridge and Christen now, absolutely no problem. Out with my constituency and under this SNP Government, Scotland has seen delivery of the Queen's Ferry Crossing, the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route and the M74 motorway improvement projects. And to the north, the Government have underlined their commitment to improving the A96, including the duelling the road from Inverness to Nairn and the Nairn Bypass. And I think great credit has to go to my colleague Fergus Ewing, who I know is an absolute champion for this road. Today's motion acknowledges, uh, coming on to Graeme Simpson's point, that the statutory responsibility for local roads improvement, maintenance and repairs does lie with local authorities. And I'm sure all in the Chamber will agree that it is for local elected representatives to make local decisions on how best to deliver services to their local communities. Nevertheless, in 2024-25, local government settlement provided record funding of over £14 billion to local authorities. And while the Tory motion today calls on the Scottish Government to increase funding to local authorities, they do this fully in the knowledge that successive Tory UK governments have given us more than a decade of austerity, a disastrous Brexit and a catastrophic mini-budget that almost crashed the economy. These economic calamities have severely hampered our ability to fund capital projects and have created an incredibly diff difficult fiscal environment which has been exasperated even further by the UK Government's de decade and a half of failure to invest in public services and infrastructure. This continual lack of investment in Scotland you need to conclude. in a real terms deficit of £1.3 billion in Scotland's capital budget. And I agree with the amendment today that urges the incoming UK administration to bring forward an emergency budget immediately in order to address this financial disparity. Thank you. Thank you, we, President Officer. We now move to wind up speeches and I call Maggie Chapman up to four minutes. Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is interesting, perhaps serendipitous, that this debate follows the earlier ministerial statement on low emission zones. I was heartened in that statement and the questions to hear the Cabinet Secretary state very clearly that the primary purpose of LEZs is to improve public health. It was not all that long ago when many people could not see the links between our transport infrastructure and individual and community health and well-being. As my colleague Ariane Berger said in her opening remarks, we understand that a well-maintained road network is important for our economy and our communities, but it is not enough on its own. Our transport system also has an impact on physical and mental health, on access to culture and leisure facilities, on access to education and work, on so many different aspects of our lives, pretty much every aspect of our lives. In that joined up way of thinking, so we need an integrated and coherent approach to transport. We should, as highlighted already this afternoon, be doing all we can to change how we use our roads. If we reduce the amount of freight and commuting traffic on our roads by shifting goods and passengers to rail, then we reduce the building and maintenance costs for our road network and our local authorities. Modal shift for people and for goods is vital. It is good for safety, it is good for climate emissions, and it's good for efficient and effective use of public money. Modal shift will also mean that we don't just replace polluting vehicles with electric vehicles. Private car use does not always meet people's needs, and we know we can catalyse shifts away from car use if we provide alternatives. We see that very, very clearly in other parts of the world. And for those people who say that we need to retain exactly, we, we just need a, a replacement of uh, internal combustion engine vehicles with um, electric vehicles, I think if we look back over 100 years, when the Victorians were looking at their transport system and they wanted to get between places better, one of the answers was faster horses. That works up only to a point. Along comes the combustion engine and changes everything. We know with technology and the right kinds of investment we can do that. Our transport system is also a key driver of inequality in our communities. Mr Ewing. Please continue, Ms Chapman. Our transport system, the Tories might not want to listen to this, but this is actually something that fundamentally affects your constituents as well as mine. The transport system is also a key driver of inequalities in our communities. 
Those who do not have access to cars need affordable, and Scottish Greens would say, free public transport. We should be investing in buses and trains, and I thank Alex Rowley for highlighting the Bus Partnership Fund in his amendment. People in the lowest income group use bus services more than three times as often as those in the higher income groups. According to the Equality Trust, the richest 10% receives £977.4 million in transport subsidy. The poorest 10% receive just £296.7 million. Road building is a subsidy for wealthy, usually white men, who are the main beneficiaries of reducing journey times between cities. So we really need to think about what our transport infrastructure should be there to do, for who it's for, and to prioritise public investment accordingly. But some roads will be necessary, so we need to make them as safe as possible. We've heard much about safety already this afternoon, but I will just reiterate one point. There is substantial evidence that shows speed is the primary cause of accidents on our roads. If we reduce speed, we save lives, and duelling roads does not reduce speed. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, our constituents and our communities deserve sustainable transportation solutions that benefit everyone. We must take seriously our responsibilities to those for whom the current systems do not work. And we must also take seriously our responsibilities to future generations by leaving a transport infrastructure legacy that supports a greener, healthier and more connected future. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on uh, Pauline McNeill. Um, up to four minutes, Ms McNeill. Scotland should have a modern road network, safe to travel on, properly maintained. Yes, we need fewer cars on the road, but we still need a good road system. We are lagging behind the rest of Northern Europe, which has excellent roads in good quality, but they also have good public transport systems, so it is possible to have both. By comparison, Scotland's road network is still patchy in places and unfinished. On Glasgow's M8 motorway, it just seems like a mess at the moment. It is Scotland's busiest motorway and is crucial for the West of Scotland economy. And the remediation work was supposed to be completed last week. Now, that was last year. It was revised to the end of this year. But it now seems that that is now expected to be completed in 2026, with costs rising. Um, it will cause considerable difficulties for road users, but also, as my colleague Paul Sweeney points out, for um, communities. Um, now, there are factors beyond the contractor's control, that is Amy, um, who are a great team, but I would say there's still got to be accountability for the length of time this is taking and the money that it has now cost. Drivers and communities need to be kept informed of the ongoing development if it's going to take a further three years. We need to be able to trust that it does require three years because often people drive by it. OK, you should make assumptions, but they don't see any workers on the road. So we need some accountability and information and engagement with those affected. But not surprisingly, one of the top issues people still raise, as Alec Rowley and others have said, is potholes. It's become quite a significant topical issue in this election, certainly. In February this year, a new study conducted by Smart Survey named Glasgow as the worst city for potholes outside of London. Now, Glasgow does pride itself on being second to London in many other things, but not on this one. But apart from being a risk to pedestrians and cyclists and motorcyclists, potholes cause damage to cars and bikes and can cause fatal accidents. So it's not a trivial matter. Mm -hmm. But they also cause hazards on the road as drivers try to avoid them. And we've all seen this if you're a driver. Um, taxis across the city of Glasgow say potholes are a nightmare. And one taxi driver said, on brand new vehicles, guys are having to replace the wheels because they're getting cracked after hitting these potholes. So having a good road network is essential to things. Uh, it does not mean that we don't want to get more people out of cars using buses and trains but both is necessary. I'll give way to Briefly, Stephen Kerr. She also agreed that the condition of the roads is a matter of civic pride, and many people in Scotland are embarrassed by the state of the roads in their communities. Polly McNeill. I actually think that is absolutely true. I mean, just talking to people, they're frustrated at the dangers that it caused, but they also feel embarrassed. When I opened my speech 
uh, I talked about other European cities, which I have had the benefit of driving through these roads. I have seen it for myself. So, Having a good road network is essential, but it doesn't mean that we don't, get, we don't want to get more people out of their cars onto buses and trains. So the amendment talks about the bus partnership fund. It's essential to transform the quality of bus journeys. If we don't encourage the quality of bus journeys, we will not get more people who don't use buses using buses. And as the Cabinet Secretary described, it's a key area of investment. Now, the project is meant to improve bus reliability and speed, and these are two of the reasons why people don't use buses currently, who don't already. Um, so we know, it's, uh, as Maggie Chapman points out, it's for lower income households tend to use buses. But if we've got more people using buses, there must be investment in the partnership. I want to see this happen, certainly in the lifetime of this Parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms McNeill. I, I now call on the Cabinet Secretary up to five minutes. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I, I thank members for their contributions, regardless of the particular views that we might have in a political context, we all recognise the importance of a safe, efficient, accessible transport network right across Scotland, which is crucial to economic growth and the wellbeing of Scotland. At the outset, I welcome today's debate and it gave the opportunity to highlight the progress this government has made in maintaining and improving the transport network. And despite what the Conservatives might think, we are delivering for the people of Scotland. I am not saying, to quote Mr Mountain, that it is perfect, but progress is being made, including the Mabel Pie Pass on the A77, which opened in 2022, and I might point out to Mr Carson that it is within the last seven years. The UK Government's spring budget, however, falls far short of what we need to deliver and all the improvements we would like to make to Scotland's infrastructure. And that is why, in this UK election, we have called for an emergency budget to address the hole in Scotland's capital budget of over £1.3 billion. Of course, in the course of this debate, I've listened carefully to the arguments on progress with drilling works on the A9 between Perth and Inverness and improvements on the A9 corridor, A96 corridor, along with improvements uh, to the A75. Uh, as I have highlighted, we are making significant progress towards delivering our A9 duelling delivery programme. The delivery uh, plan for completion of the A9 duelling entails continuous construction activity from the time the work starts in the Tomat and Tomoy project until duelling is complete. This means that sections of dual carriageway will become operational on a progressive basis, with nearly 50 per cent of the A9 between Perth and Inverness expected to be operating as dual carriageway by the end of 2030, rising to 85 by the end of 2033 and 100% by the end of 2035. Improvements to the A75 and A77 are a direct recommendation within SPR2, with progress now being made on improvements for the A75. And also in relation to the A83, I was uh, recently there inspecting the changes and improvements to the Old Military Road, um, as well as uh, hearing the progress on the medium and long-term uh, solutions. I also recognise that there, I'm very sorry, it's a very short debate. I also recognise that there are many calls on council budgets too. Um, it would be wrong for the Scottish Government, however, and this Parliament to tell local authorities how to manage and best allocate their resources. And Mr Rowley may want to correct uh, the official record because he will be aware that between 2023 and 2024-25, um, the share of the council budget of the Scottish Government's budget uh, uh, rose from 31% to 32%. Now, it's a small increase, but it's an increase. But that would obviously have to be at the detriment of other parts of um, the budget within the Scottish Government's control. On road safety, which I am very pleased that uh, Fulton McGregor touched on, that remains an absolute priority for the Scottish Government. And we continue to make progress on road safety, particularly on trunk roads. But recent road safety statistics generally are concerning. And, President Officer, I will probably want to return to the Chamber on this specific matter. And finally, I'd like to reiterate that responsibility for local roads do, does lie with local authorities. And it isn't for us to tell local authorities how to manage and best allocate the resources. However, I have heard across the chamber the need to recognise all um, uh, improved asset management at uh, all levels of government. And I will quote uh, Graeme Simpson in the future that it's not necessarily new roads, um, but decent roads. And I will also quote him when he says the trunk road network does the heavy lifting. So in conclusion, President Officer, this government remains firmly committed to infrastructure investment as a key 
factor in securing economic growth and high quality public infrastructure across Scotland. And again, I call for the UK, incoming UK Government to deliver an emergency budget to address the £1.3 billion plus hole in Scotland's capital budget created by the UK Government. And of course, that of course, would benefit councils as well as the Scottish Government trunk road network. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And I now invite uh, Murdo Fraser to wind up the debate up to six minutes. Mr Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Conservatives make no apology for using our debate time to highlight the importance of our road network, because having an efficient and well-maintained road network is essential to our economy. It allows people and goods to move around more easily, and it contributes to economic growth. And I would say to uh, Ariane Burgess and Maggie Chapman, whose contributions to this debate I very much welcomed, that there is no contradiction between having a good, well-maintained road network and meeting our climate ambitions. Because we need to remember, we want to encourage the use of public transport, which is important. The most popular form of public transport, buses, require roads to drive on. And as we move towards more electrified vehicles, they will also need roads to travel on. So suggesting we should cease road improvements, as the government in Wales, which of course is run by Mr Johnson's party, has done, because of our climate targets, is simply misunderstanding the role that roads play. But I'll give way to Mr Johnson. Daniel Johnson, briefly. I wondered if the member would be interested that the Danish government has found that well-maintained roads are worth up to 8% in uh, CO2 uh, emissions in terms of the efficiency they provide. I wonder if you would find that uh, point a uh, uh, one to, to reflect on. Murdo Fraser. Thank you, thank you, Mr Johnson. That's a very helpful uh, intervention. You're quite, you're quite right. Uh, well-maintained roads and well-maintained vehicles of course, which good, require well-maintained roads to drive on, are good in terms of reducing our climate emissions. Now, we've heard a lot about potholes. Graham Simpson uh, regaled us with stories of potholes. We heard the same from uh, Alec Rowley uh, and from Beatrice Wishart. BBC Scotland uh, are reporting today campaigners claiming people are leaving Caithness due to potholes because their cars are being damaged on a regular basis. People leaving jobs in the care sector who have to use their cars to travel around are having so much damage done to their vehicles they cannot afford the cost of repairs on their relatively low salaries. And people in Caithness were holding up signs saying, welcome to the moon because of the size of the, cat of the craters uh, they were encountering. So it is a serious issue. And there's another angle in relation to road improvements, and that's the question of road safety. Because every year, too many people lose their lives on our roads. In the past three years, there have been 144 deaths on Scotland's major trunk roads outside the central belt. Many of these deaths are avoidable and would not be happening if we had better quality, safer roads. Now, I've raised many times in this chamber before the need for the upgrading of the A9 to dual carriageway between Perth and Inverness. And I'm truly sorry to have to keep raising this issue again and again. The SNP government promised in 2011 that the A9 would be dualed by 2025. I can well remember the current First Minister campaigning on this issue and making promises that A9 dualing would be delivered, both to improve the economic opportunities for Perthshire and the Highlands, but also because of the overriding necessity of improving road safety. And we know, presiding officer, that promise has been broken. In the period that the SNP have been in office, only 11 miles of the A9 have been dueled, leaving over 70 miles remaining. At its current rate, the A9 would take more than a century to duel. Now, to put this into perspective, yes, I will. Cabinet go. Secretary. I will uh, send the member the programme that makes it quite clear that isn't the case. And I think by having such exaggeration, he actually diminishes the argument he's making. Murdo Fraser. Well, I have to say to the Transport Secretary, we have had promises before that have not been delivered. So we'll believe it uh, when we see it. So to put this into perspective, in 18 years of the last Conservative government to have responsibility for roads in Scotland, we managed to duel 62 miles of the A9. In 17 years, the SNP have duelled just 11. And that statistic alone demonstrates the scale of the broken promise to the people of Perthshire and the Highlands. And it has real-life consequences, with individuals dying every year in avoidable accidents, families losing loved ones, and members of the emergency services having to face trauma and distress. Now, I commend my colleague Edward Mountain 
uh, for his contribution to the Citizens' Participation and Public Petitions Committee of this Parliament, ably led by my friend Jackson Carlaw, for the work they have done on the SNP's failure to duel the A9, and I pay tribute to Laura Hansler, the petitioner, for the assiduous way she has pursued this matter. And the previous First Minister, Alex Salmon, told that committee when he left office he believed the commitment to duel the A9 would be fulfilled. But under the watch of his successor, Nicola Sturgeon, precious little progress has been made. Indeed, it seems to be a pattern for the SNP to try and blame everybody else for their failure yeah. and their lack of progress. Because we continually hear from the SNP about Tory austerity affecting budgets. But the reality is that in this current financial year, according to the independent Fraser of Allender Institute, the Scottish Government's budget is up 69% in real terms since devolution and up 7% in real terms since 2010, even accounting for inflation, which has been a major issue. The Scottish Government has more money to spend than before. If it is not investing in roads, if it is not upgrading routes like the A9, that is a political choice it has made, and we are living with the consequences of that. Presiding officer, it is short-sighted not to prioritise road projects. The A9, the A96, the A77, A75, Finlay Carson referred to, they are all in desperate need of investment, and yet the political choice the SNP government have made is not to prioritise these. That is a serious error. Presiding officer, if the SNP are serious about economic growth, now it has ditched the Greens from the coalition. If it is serious about road safety and serious about saving lives, it needs to start investing in our roads. That is the point made in our motion today, and I commend it to the Chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Fraser. That concludes the debate on improving Scotland roads. Um, there will be a brief pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow front benches to change.